And as we always do, we begin with Wordsworth, and we have a new curator, Sybil James, a well-known, uh, longtime poet of Seattle who has eight books to her credit, and she told me she's just coming out with a new book, her memoir of living in uh, Ivory Coast. And uh, all I can say is that she's a great poet, a PhD in English, and has taught in the China, Mexico, and as a Fulbright professor in Tunisia, and of course, the Ivory Coast. Sybil, it's all yours. Okay, well, since Nick created Wordsworth and has been a friend of mine for longer than we'd want to say, um, I thought that I would read a poem I wrote years ago about Nick growing up in Ohio. And the, I'm pretending to speak as Nick in the poem, but of course all the opinions are mine. <laughs> Shine and a haircut. My father specialized in flat tops for years, a cardboard sign in the shop window curling in Cleveland sun, curls of hair my father swept into the dustpan like a disinterested Don Juan, a man afraid of lockets, what they hold. My father was not sentimental. An I Italian in an Irish neighborhood, shaving cops and old men while I shined their shoes. A man likes to have his shoes shined when his hair is cut, likes to see the clean line of his ear mirrored in gleaming shoe leather, the white nape of his neck above the tan, the last thing a barber does, running the clippers there before he flicks away the towel, lifting a stubbled cloud. Faces shining out of shoes with pointed toes, the kind of shoes Italians wear and Irish, the kind of shoes my father wore, but not the kind the men in Argosy magazines I read between shines. Women hate it when a man has his hair cut. They don't love him for days. Think how ugly logic is, how hygienic the burr of electric clippers against their fingers slipping behind his neck. They keep their fingers there, but let their eyes wander to men on safari without razors, unkempt as sensuality, men in argosy with dust on their shoes. A man has to have a gimmick, he thinks, and to be Italian among Irish is not one. But a colorblind son with cakes of black, brown, and neutral in his kit, a kid with smooth skin and dark Italian eyes, too innocent for a spit shine in a New York subway. But this was Cleveland. Slow lines, time to read Argosy, to think about women, what shoes to wear for them, what lines to give them. My father lying to my mother as long as he could about his age, about his money, gimmicks flimsy as a cardboard sign. What things women trying to love forgive and keep their fingers gentle on necks, the careful generosity of lions in a circus of spit shine shoes, a woman's world of cats and green shingled roofs sleeping in their fur like jungles, storing their passions in a locket deep in their throats. My mother bringing the thermos of coffee and all the curls lifting on the shop floor in the mute roar of her wind. There remain the women's foraging eyes, stripping the, flipping the streets like pages. And the colors of them I can't see, only the gimmick of neutral camouflaging their shine, forgiving the lines men give them, lines that shift in and out of fashion, but are always like stripes on a barber pole. Peppermint, ordered, and the same. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm happy to welcome my good friend and excellent Northwest poet, Emily Warren. Her latest of five books is Shadow Architect, A Spiritual Journey Through the 22 Letters of the Hebrew Alphabet. And yes, it's really deep stuff. Her essays and poems appear widely, including in Seattle Times, Poetry, Poetry Northwest, KUOW, and the Writer's Almanac. She currently offers courses at Richard Hugo House, and after serving for five years as editor-in-chief of PoetryFoundation.org in Chicago, she is now happily back home in Seattle, where she grows onions, reads murder mysteries, and rows three days a week at 5.30 a.m. with the Conabare Rowing Club, to which I believe <laughs> you also belong. <laughs> Um, I wrote this poem in the early 80s when I lived in 
one of Seattle's most notorious and earliest communes with Niklakata called Prague House. And for those of you who've been around that long, you'll notice some things that are no longer here. It's called Metro and some that are. This is called Metro Transfer. They changed the numbers of the bus routes. The number 10 no longer climbs the hill past terrestrial views art gallery and the shop window filled with chandeliers. They scrambled all the vistas. Gasworks Park is now on the shore of Puget Sound. Numbers lost their neighborhoods, lost their names. I can no longer say, there goes a man from the 43, a Swede. Someone else's face opens and shuts like his, tending the locks he imagined as he rode to and from canals. Women loaded with packages curse oddly instead of evenly. Drunks board the free ride and end up in the yards of the rich, unable to find their way back downtown. The bus to the ferry travels far inland. Mirages shine between traffic and the driver, blinded by years of late sun on water. He swerves to Missy Taxi, thinking it's a slow tug. Nurses past midnight in the Bowery District frantic for their bus, watch the street open like a drawbridge. Tall masts glide past. They ask the man in the crow's nest, has he seen the nine, the number nine, number nine, number nine? Thank you. Thank you. So would you introduce our poet today? Thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce poet and friend, Larry Lawrence. Um, Larry's books include uh, a book of poetry called Life of the Bones to Come, which was chosen as a nat National Poetry Month selection by the National Association of College Stores, and another book of poetry scenes beginning with the footbridge at the lake. He also has poems in anthologies how Much Earth, The Fresno Poets, and Jack Straw Writers, as well as in journals such as Cut Bank, Poetry Northwest, Poole, Southern Poetry Review, The Raven Chronicles, and Prose Poems. He's received awards from the Seattle Arts Commission, Artist Trust, and had residencies at Squaw Valley Community of Writers and Cummington Center for the Arts. And he has had the pleasure of studying with the man just announced as the new United States Poet Laureate, Philip Levine. Thank you. This is a poem called uh, Headlines, and I dedicate it to the Seattle PI, the last paper publication, which was uh, March 18, 2009. And because Jean Godden is here, I'll also dedicate it to her today, given, given her very wonderful career in journalism. Not with the P.I., though. <laughs> Not anymore. Okay. All right. Uh, headlines. <clears throat> Man found. Man found completely. Man found completely clear. Man found completely clear with heart. Man found completely clear with heart and mouth. Known for invention, man found completely clear with heart and mouth. Known for invention of sounds, Man found completely clear with heart and mouth. Washed up at river's edge, known for invention of sounds. Man found completely clear with heart and mouth. Washed up at river's edge beside two birds, known for invention of sounds. Man found completely clear with heart and mouth. Newly washed up at river's edge beside two birds atop tree, known for invention of sounds. Man found completely clear with heart and mouth. Newly washed up at river's edge beside two birds atop tree known for invention of sounds. Man found completely clear with heart and mouth after wrestling self. Newly found man washed up beside two birds atop tree by river's edge. Completely clear with heart and mouth known for invention of sounds after wrestling self. 
describes shaken former self. Beside two birds atop a tree at river's edge, newly washed up man known for invention of sounds found completely clear after wrestling self with heart and mouth describes shaken former self as cover. Man known for invention of sounds newly found washed up at river's edge beside two birds atop tree completely clear after wrestling self describes with heart and mouth shaken former self as cover band. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And thank you all for coming to hear friend and poet Sharon Cumberland, who teaches English at Seattle University and is also the director of the creative writing program there. Her first full collection of poems called Peculiar Honors and with this lovely cover that you can all memorize and go out and buy, um, is out next month from Black Heron Press, which is the local Seattle press. She's been published in many journals and has won a multitude of awards, including from Calliope Press, the Pacific Northwest Writers Association, Writers Haven, Bright, Writers Haven Press Brightside Award. She was a writer in residence at the Jack Straw Foundation and poet in residence at the Seasons Music Festival in Yakima. And her previous chapbooks are The Arithmetic of Mourning and Greatest Hits, 1985 to 2000. Sharon Cumberland. Oh, hi, everybody. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm actually from New York. And when I came here uh, from New York City, I was thrilled to find in Seattle the Burt Gilman Trail. And I started walking along the trail a lot and writing poems based upon things I see there. And uh, one day I was uh, riding my bike along the Burke Gilman Trail from the UW uh, to um, Ballard. And I saw off to the side the um, hardware supply store called uh, Tacoma Screw. And I guess coming from New York, that struck me as hilarious. So I had to write a poem about it, and this is that poem. It's called Tacoma Screw. It's not what you think. It's just an industrial fabricator in Washington State. Tools, pipe fittings, screws. You, however, thought of bad behavior, something performed in brothels, the Wild West. Or perhaps you thought it was the moniker of someone bad and dashing, Don Giovanni, Mac the Knife, Tacoma Screw. I don't blame you. It's the nature of double entendres, everybody's smutty joke. Maybe the old gent back in 1892, hanging his shingle, setting out stores, came up with a little pun for the loggers on the corduroy road. Not the sort of codger to mind that cyclists a century later ride by and snigger at the innocent past, Tacoma Screw. As though the risque is invented anew in the mind of every kid on a mountain bike. On the other hand, there could have been a Tacoma Screw, like Butch Cassidy or Billy the Kid, seductive as Casanova, glamorous as Zorro, renowned among the mountain men and dancing girls in rock gut saloons all up and down the Columbia, famous for his threaded weapon, once sunk, so hard to remove. <laughs> Thank you very much. Today we have Wordsworth curated by Sybil James. And Sybil, I'm going to ask you to, besides doing the poem today, uh, talk a little bit about your recent published book that you'll be giving a reading, I believe, this Thursday evening. Oh, good. Thanks for the promo. Um, yeah, I have my ninth book. It uh, just came out, and I'm reading from it. It's the debut reading tomorrow night at Elliott Bay Book Company at 7 o'clock, so it would be great to see you all there. It's called The Last War of Woro to Trashville, a West African memoir. Woro Woros are communal taxis in uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast. And Trashville is a section of Abidjan in Ivory Coast. And those of you who are old enough to know might see that I'm making a reference to the last train to Clarksville. Okay. So, enough about me. Um, the scheduled poet for today was Kathleen Flanagan, 
but unfortunately, she is attending a funeral of a friend right now. So I'm going to say something about her work and then read her poem for her. Um, her first book of poetry, which is called Famous, was named a notable book by the American Library Association and a finalist for the Washington State Book Award. Her second collection, Plume, which is about growing up in Richland next to the Hanford nuclear site, will be published in spring 2012 by the University of Washington Press. And I've heard a lot of poems from that book, and um, they are really, really a good insight into what's gone on over at the, the so-called Hanford Reservation. OK, Kathleen's poem for today. Um, well, it's about the pronunciation of the word in its title, so I'm going to just call it this. Coyote. Pronunciation, coyote, but chiefly Western, coyote. After years away, I met you again on the tongue of an old friend from home, coyote. Trotting through sagebrush, wild by any name, I'd moved to a green isle city that pronounced you coyote and abandon you by the side of the road. I'd forgotten your silver slope-shouldered form and gaze. You're not a citizen of language or memory, but I am. Changing your name was a betrayal of home, born of living among outsiders, born of looking back through outsiders' eyes at interchangeable houses landscaped with wishing wells and pansies. I could never love the brown hills around us. Now, in the city, who can love the desert in me? Coyote, coyote, you live outside pronunciation. I have become like you and can't say your name either way. Thank you. Thank you.